Hi there everyone. So have you been wondering about what are the exam issues or what are the topics from my syllabus that come up often in the exam? You know, what are the main areas that I should study upon? The syllabus is so vast. The exam is close by. What should I focus upon? What are the major issues? So this video is aimed to help you give that direction of study to help you just focus on the major areas. So we have identified top exam issues. We have identified areas that often come up in the exam and we want to present it to you. So that makes your study a whole lot flexible and focused on the major issues and topics revolving around the same. So you've already been on the channel, so you may know a bit of an introduction about me, but just a quick one for those who are new. My name is Devansh and I'm the lead tutor at Fin Tutors. We are SEMA registered tuition providers and all the you know, study resources and details that we are giving you comes out of our experience of tutoring students for a very long time now and delivering high pass rates. So I'm sure this top exam issues video is going to be really helpful for you. If you have any you know, doubts or questions, you can put it in the comment section or you can reach out to us and we'll be most happy to help. Let's get started. So you might be wondering how do we come up with these explanations, right? How with these topics, how do we know what is going to be tested in the exam? First and foremost, we focus on the pre-scene. We do a lot of analysis of the pre-scene even before it goes out to the students. We do a deep dive to understand the theme of the pre-scene and to pick out the nitty gritties, to look at the details in the pre-scene and hence understand the topics that can come up. Thirdly, we make our students write pre-scene quizzes. So when students write quizzes and send them to us for evaluation, we learn from a different perspective as well. Different students think in different ways. So we take that on board along with the detailed SWOT analysis that we create and then understand that, okay, these are the major areas, major problems, major issues with the company. And this is where there is an opportunity for them to ask questions. That's how we accumulate the list of topics. It's an experience based and a result backed approach along with student perspective approach as well. So everything that we do is backed by results because we have been getting our high results, our high pass rates, we're able to deliver different methods of effective studying. And this is one of them, which is giving you the exam favorite topics, which we have identified throughout years of teaching this operational case study exam. Before I begin discussing the areas, the first thing that I want to address is that I'll go topic by topic. There are about 10, 11 topics that we have identified as important. It's not that the first topic is the most important one and the 10th topic is the least important one. It's not been presented that way. It's just that these 10 topics or 11 topics that we have have been curated as a list because we find all of these areas to be important and all of these areas are ones which the exam can ask you a question upon. So keeping that in mind, let's dive right in. The first topic we want to discuss is risk and uncertainty. So this is part E of our core areas or the blueprint areas which are identified by SEMA. If you don't know what the blueprints are, I'll leave a link in the description below or I'll just flash it on screen, which takes you to our blueprint explanatory video. So what the blueprints are, what SEMA has identified the core areas as that will be showcased in that video and obviously it's a very vital part to your studies. So risk and uncertainty is part E of your core areas, something that is given importance as part of this exam. So what type of questions can come up? The first kind of question which is common is analyzing a new investment. They can give you two options. They can say this is investment A, investment B. They can give you the expected value, standard deviation, and all of that ask you to analyze which is risky, which is less risky. You should be able to answer that question. Second, they can ask you to analyze the risk of a new venture. Again, analysis of a new investment, of a new venture, risk attitudes. That is a question that often comes up in SEMA exams. The third very common question is analyzing a table or a decision tree 
that has been given so sometimes they'll give you a table and you know the table will be on different risk attitudes or on different risk based decision making like minimax maximax and you know all of that and then they'll ask you to make a decision based on a certain risk decision making technique so they'll tell you you are a risk seeker which outcome will you go with so you should be able to analyze that table and pick the outcome out and explain it same way they can give you a decision tree they can ask you to explain point a point b or point c on a decision tree it does happen so this is part of your p1 syllabus and towards the end chapters rather so you must study what expected values mean what standard deviation means what the different risk attitudes are what the different risk based decision making techniques are this is something that is clearly presented in your p1 syllabus and is an exam favorite question so something that we must be clear about so now just imagine i have given you these important areas you revise them and you've written a mock question on them and then one of these topics comes up in the exam just imagine your mind frame it's going to be so much more calm so much more prepared that's the entire purpose of me being here identifying the important areas for you so you can study them and then obviously write mock questions on them which we provide for our students because just knowing the area doesn't help you need to work on it you need to put them into words and get it checked professionally marked by someone that is why we are here and that is why mock questions are most important so risk and uncertainty is one area that often comes up mainly analyzing mainly reading mainly making a decision picking out the correct uh, decision stuff like that does come up in this exam and this is one area we would like you to focus upon important area number 2 then this is everything related to costing very important part and part a of your core area so there are six core areas as you would already know if you've studied the blueprints we do a very unique blueprint explanation document as well which limits your study very very much because it's a very focused document you'll not find it anywhere else because it's only us that does it so if you've gone through the blueprint explanation or just know what the blueprints are you will know there are six areas throughout all of this or or rather this entire topic list we have tried to look at topics from each of these six areas which often come up so we have covered everything so costing is part a of your core areas you might be wondering what type of questions come up again so sometimes what happens is very common costing related question is on relevant costing so they'll say that we are making a certain decision they'll provide a list of costs and then you need to identify which costs are relevant and which are not you'll have to give your explanations for that as well so the principles of relevant costing are absolutely vital to know secondly sometimes they'll give you costing information and tables they'll be present in the question they'll say that let's say you're using the absorption costing system for x product this is what it looks like you're using the marginal costing system for y product this is what it looks like why is there a difference between them you should be able to explain that because both costing systems are different right you don't need to calculate anything but looking at the table you may have to give justifications so you may also have to tell them why one costing system is better than the other so the advantages and disadvantages of each costing system are vital here this is part of your p1 syllabus again a very favorite exam question which often does come up so you must be present with relevant costing principles you must be ready with that absorption costing marginal costing digital costing which has been newly introduced and activity based costing principles have to be absolutely clear what is absorption costing you should be clear with that what is marginal costing you should be clear activity based costing cost pools cost drivers the advantages and disadvantages of each i'm not asking you to learn every single word i'm not asking you to learn every single advantage and disadvantage just maybe keep two in your mind two advantages 
two disadvantages of each method in your own simple words and that will be enough for you to write and explain when a mock question comes in front of you. I hope you started to see the value in this important area discussion because just imagine if you've revised these areas and topics that we are presenting to you and then you've written a mock question on them which you know pretty much comes from us and have got it evaluated know your mistakes and then any of these topics comes up in the exam just imagine your preparedness just imagine that you're ready to go that's a chance that I would not be willing to take and rather be prepared on at least these topics in terms of writing mocks, getting them marked, getting them checked, because it's a matter of passing the exam, right? I don't want to take the exam again. That's what we need to keep in mind. So important area number three is working capital management. This is another area which often comes up as a subtask. So sometimes, you know, you might have an understanding of what a case study exam is like. But for those who are new, in every question, they can ask, they can put two subtasks or three subtasks for that matter. And any one of those subtasks could be working capital management. It often does come up. So what type of questions can you expect? Now, often they asked that, you know, once you've done your pre-scene analysis, you'll know what the company's receivable position is because we'll make that financial analysis for you, what the cash position is, what the payables position is. We'll give you all of those details in our pre-scene analysis. You'll know that. So somewhere there could be an issue. In the exam, they can simply ask you a question saying, this is our current receivable position. How can we better it? Please give me suggestions on how it can be made better. Same way they can do for cash, same way they can do for payables. How do I improve this, this position? And what are the issues that could arise if we change the working capital cycle or if the working capital cycle is affected? What happens if there is large receivables or large payables? There are issues that arise in dealing with cash, right? So that needs to be kept in mind and that needs to be something which you analyze, which you keep in your mind when you are revising this topic. So this is part of your F1 syllabus and we must study the different working capital management techniques which are taught throughout the F1 end chapters. What I will say is an effective method of studying this area is that you visualize your pre-seen company. Keep your company in mind and know what its receivable cash or payables position is. When you are revising that part, Imagine they've asked you, how can I improve receivables? So gather up the knowledge that you've studied from that particular area, from that particular chapter. Close your eyes or just, you know, try to speak to yourself. So we would do this, we would do this and try to create an explanation in your own mind. Actually speak it out loud because it can help you hear yourself and develop confidence if you are giving correct suggestions, you'll automatically know that, right? So visualize your company and imagine how can the position be made better? What happens if we are holding too much cash? What happens which, uh, you know, if you have a high payables position right now, what can happen and what are the solutions to better it? Keep that in your mind and make it specific to your company. It will really turn out to be a fruitful learning experience. Working capital management is part F of our core areas. So from each core area, we are trying to pick out important topics which often do come up in the exam to get you maximum preparedness. Next core area I speak about is budgeting. This is an important topic. It does often come up. So this is part B of your core areas and again part of your P1 syllabus. You will see, and I have mentioned in the very beginning as well, in my introduction to the operational case study, that P1 is the most important pillar of this exam. Absolutely clear, concise knowledge of P1 is required for this exam. If you haven't viewed my introduction video yet, I'll put a link just above in the description or, you know, it'll be flashing somewhere. You can view it, it will be very helpful. So budgeting, often asked, the type of questions are quite varying for budgeting, but I've tried to summarize them for you. So first and foremost, which budgeting system would you recommend for your business often comes up. 
they'll tell you when you do the entire pre-scene and financial analysis with me, you'll know what the budgeting system for your company is. Let's say your company is using an incremental budgeting system. For example, you must clearly know what the advantages of this system are, what the disadvantages of this system are. And then you must also know what the different budgeting systems available are. So that if they asked you, what would you suggest? You can tell them that, okay, we can move to an incremental budgeting system or a zero based budgeting system or an activity based budgeting system. You should have knowledge of each budgeting system that is in your P1 syllabus. Again, two advantages, two disadvantages of each in your own words is very, very important. A common question in the exam is where they give you, let's say a fixed budgeting system table and a flexed budgeting system table. They'll ask you, why is uh, fixed budgeting not good for volatile businesses? Why is flexed budgeting good? So you'll have to know each method very clearly. A very common scenario is that they'll give you analysis of two different kinds of budgets or they'll, you know, raise a situation where they want you want you to move from one system to another. So you should be clear about the budgeting systems. Like I said, analysis of two budgeting systems is often given. And this is a vital part of your P1 syllabus, you must study the fixed budgeting system principles, flexed budgeting system principles, the budgeting techniques like zero based budgeting, incremental budgeting, activity based budgeting, the disadvantages and advantages of each two two of each should be known clearly over here. That brings us to topic number five, or important topic number five, rather, this is the important IASs, which is the international accounting standards, and the IFRSs, international financial reporting standards, which we must know. This is part of your core area D. And this has everything to do with your F1 syllabus. So these are certain IAS and IFRSs which are often tested in the exam, which are again favorite if you look at the exam perspective. What kind of questions can come up? You know that this exam is nothing to do with calculation. You will never be asked to sit and calculate. You'll only be asked to analyze, give them suggestions, show them how the recording of certain IS rules happens, you'll never be asked to calculate anything. So how are IS's or IFRS's asked? First is, there is a common question which says, which rather deals with property plant and equipment, recognition queries. They'll tell you that we have acquired a new machine. How should we recognize it? They'll tell you it costs this much, setup costs are this much, depreciation is this much, all of that they'll tell you. How will you recognize it? So you should be clearly knowing the rules of IAS 16, which is property, plant and equipment. Another very related question that they ask is close to revaluation. They'll ask you that we already have an asset, but we are now trying to revalue it. So previously acquired asset is being re-evaluated. Re Explain the revaluation process and steps that a company has to follow. Again, IAS 16, the chapter in F1 needs to be very clearly known to suggest revaluation rules. Another common area which I feel is important is IAS 2, which is dealing with inventories management. If you have a company that is, you know, in the manufacturing space, sometimes SEMA gives us service related companies. Sometimes it gives us manufacturing companies. So if it's a manufacturing entity specifically, there can be the situation where your company holds inventory. If it holds inventory, how to recognize it, how to manage it. This is often asked. This is part of your IS2 in F1 syllabus. A very common question is related to leases. Leases is IFRS 16, part of your F1 syllabus again. Common question, they'll ask you that, you know, I'm looking to lease or buy, but rather uh, the management is interested in the leasing decision. They'll give you the entire details. They'll tell you these are the lease payments. This is the interest rate. How will we record the same? So you will clearly have to tell them 
what the lease liability means, what the right of use of the asset means, what the numbers as the lease payments are already given to you, what will they mean? You should clearly be able to give them that. For that, you need to revise your IFRS 16 from your F1 syllabus. So these are some important IASs that often come up in the exam. And when you do mock questions with us, we'll test you on a whole different bunch of IASs as well. But yes, these do often come up as we have experienced and that is why we point them out in important area discussions. Next topic we're speaking about is variances. This is again part of your P1 syllabus and from your P1 book, you can see how heavily this exam is focusing upon P1. That should be the bare minimum that you are clear about, that you have good knowledge about. So what kind of variance questions has come up? A very, very, very common question is that they'll give you different kinds of variances as a table. So they'll say, you know, direct labor variance, this much, adverse or favorable. They'll mention that. They'll give you material price variance, this much, adverse or favorable. They'll mention that. And then they'll ask you to explain why that particular variance was adverse or could have been adverse or why that variance was favorable or could have been favorable. So the reasons for those variances are often asked. And this is present in your P1 syllabus as well. They've clearly given you six or seven reasons for a variance to occur for each category in your P1 syllabus. I'm not going to ask you to learn each or I'm not going to ask you to learn all the seven that have been given but two or three you can keep in your mind. Material price variance occurs because of this, this and this. Material efficiency variance occurs because of this, this and this. Labor efficiency variance in the same way, material usage variance, sorry. Material usage variance occurs because of this, this and this reason. Labor efficiency variance occurs because of this, this and this. Adverse or favorable, whatever it is in the question, you'll provide your explanation in that particular way or form. So a very common variance question is where they'll give you the variance and ask you to give them the possible reasons for each. Overlapping on the same, like I said, they'll tell you that variance is favorable or adverse and then you need to explain the same. So if you have the theory ready with you, you'll be able to apply it quickly in that scenario that they have presented and you'll be able to present an explanation. This is part of your P1 syllabus. You must clearly know what material variances are. So the material price variance, material usage variance, labor variances, the labor price variance, labor rate variance, or the labor efficiency variance needs to be known. Sales price variance, sales volume variance also needs to be known. This is part of your syllabus. What are the reasons for each adverse or favorable variance also needs to clearly be known. Topic number seven that often comes up is analyzing time series. Now often in operational case study pre-scenes, what they do is they create a company that has some kind of seasonal business or there is an opportunity that the company has a seasonal variance. It focuses on selling their products in uh, short bursts during the year and then it does normal sales throughout the year. It does happen for many companies, right? So this really brings into the time series analysis question and is often asked. So what type of questions come up? As always, you're never asked to calculate anything. You're never asked to draw anything or, you know, work out anything. It's just the explanations that we want from you. So first common question is they'll give you the time series analysis. They'll actually want an explanation as to what time series means, what the different aspects are. So what does the regression analysis mean? What does the trend line mean? What does the seasonal analysis mean? They'll give you all of that as a table. So they'll say that, you know, at the end of the year, you are selling most products or they'll give you the equation which shows that towards the end of the year, you're selling high or in the summer months, you're selling high. You'll have to tell them what seasonal variation means, what the trend line means, what regression analysis means. Often these questions come up. They'll give you the trend line. They'll give you the equation for it. What does it mean? You got to explain it. Same way, they'll give you the seasonal factors as equations or as numbers or whatever, as a table. 
you'll have to simply explain them. So the topic and the concept of what a trend line is, what seasonal variations mean, what the whole umbrella of time series analysis means and what it is useful for is often asked. They give us different sales trends in a multiplicative or an additive model, which is again part of your P1 syllabus. All you have to do is identify and explain. If it's the additive model, you give additive related explanations. If it's the multiplicative model, you give multiplication related explanations. Everything will be given to you in the question. You simply have to explain. And for that explanation to come to your mind, the topic, the concept, the theory has to be very clear with you. And that preparation is what we want you to do with the help of this video. So again, when you do mock questions with us, we have created them in such a way that you practice different avenues and different areas because we have 25 mock questions available. Once you've done these 25 questions with me, you've automatically revised, you know, 75, 80 or 90 topic areas from E1, P1 and F1. That's pretty much everything that the exam can throw at you. So through this video, we are asking you to focus on theory. And then to apply this theory, you'll have to do as many mock questions as possible because application is a whole different ball game. And no matter how well you know the theory, if you can't apply it, it's going to be a difficult situation in the exam. So we must study the time series analysis topics from your P1 syllabus very specifically. Topic number eight then is cost volume profit analysis or CVP analysis, the end of your P1 syllabus. It comes towards the end of your P1 syllabus. This is part of core area E. This is a, again, very common question that comes up as a sub part. So firstly, what kind of questions can come up? They can give us a question asking us to explain the concepts of break even point. They can give you an expected value table ask you to explain that particular decision. They can give you a sensitivity analysis, explanation aspect. They can ask you to explain what sensitivity analysis means, how it can be used. They can clearly ask you that, right? So this is one common question which comes up where they ask you the concept of break even point. How can it be helpful? The concept of expected value, the concept of sensitivity analysis. Second aspect that they can ask under this umbrella is by giving you a multi product break even chart, they will give you that chart, they'll mention different points on that chart, they'll ask you to then explain what those points mean. This is present in your P1 syllabus, they can do the same for a break even chart as well, they'll give you different points on that chart, just ask you to explain what each point means. So you should be able to tell them that point A means this point Z is the break even point, you should be able to explain that you should be able to read and explain a break even or a multi product break even chart, a deep understanding of the same is necessary. I'm slightly going to move to an overlapping concept in terms of charts and graphs, which is your linear programming graph or a linear programming problem. It does often come up. So what is the LPP? When do you use it? When do you use a linear programming graph or a linear programming problem solving technique? How and when it's used? First thing for you to know. Second, they can present the entire LPP graph in front of you. All you have to do is then explain what the different areas of the graph are. So what is the feasible region? what is x axis, what is y axis, you will have to be able to read that and explain that this is part of your P1 syllabus and you must this is a separate chapter itself for linear programming, you must clearly have a deep understanding of the same. We have come to core area number nine or topic area number nine important topic area nine. This is manufacturing related issues, which coincide with the digital aspect. This is part C and D of your core area bringing in your E1 syllabus as well. Now, if you've been given a manufacturing related company, obviously, there are manufacturing related issues that can arise as well, right? What are the type of questions that come up here? The concept of big data can be asked, the use of big data, the flaws of big data, 
that is something that you may be asked to suggest secondly hr related issues and how rewards can be managed what rewards could be given how can you keep your staff motivated that often does come up third quality related issues and quality costs often come up you know your prevention cost appraisal cost internal failure external failure costs are something which is often asked so quality related issues and quality costs can be asked fourth they can speak about move to modern manufacturing techniques right now let's say you're using a technique where you're storing a lot of inventory so they can suggest why not move to a jit system or a tqm system where no inventory is needed for that you should clearly know what jit is what tqm means what lean manufacturing means same way they can ask you to give kpis key performance indicators for your business what are the key areas that we must look at what are the key areas that we must focus towards what can be a kpi they can ask you to suggest kpis as well for a specific reason or area this all of this rather is part of your e1 syllabus so we must study big data management the hr cycle and its management quality costs key performance indicator meaning and its illustrations obviously because they'll ask you to give examples if a kpi question comes up and then your modern manufacturing techniques like jit tqm their principles also must be known these are topics that often come up in the exam that brings us to topic number 10 so this is business oriented questions this is quite a broad area that i feel important to mention because this exam tests your business skills problem solving techniques as well not everything is going to be from the textbook not everything is going to be from e1 p1 and f1 they can ask simple business oriented questions as well i'll come to that but first very important business related areas which are related to e1 p1 and f1 that i want to discuss the first is ethics related question it has to do with the overall running of a business so they can mention unethical behavior that has been carried out and then you must identify and show the correct path so for this the sema code of ethics is absolutely vital part of your f1 syllabus secondly they can come up with corporate governance issues when you do the entire pre scene analysis with me we will point out the corporate governance structure and the issues with the company so they can ask you how can we improve our corporate governance how can we better relate to the corporate governance code so the uk corporate governance code part of your f1 syllabus again becomes very important thirdly a new question that has often started to come up is your cgma cost transformation model sometimes they'll tell you that we want to save costs we want to improve on our costing system we want to completely transform how the business works and that is why we want to introduce the cgma cost transformation model it's part of your p1 syllabus but it often comes up in the exam so it's important that you know the six parts of this cost transformation model then you can just pick each part explain each part in your own words relating to your pre scene company and it would be a very good approach or structure of your answer if you do mocks with us we'll obviously test you on this so these are areas which are from the business perspective related to e1 p1 and f1 but sometimes there are questions where you need absolutely no knowledge of e1 p1 and f1 but just a present mind good problem solving techniques which is you know anything related to the common business scenario they can say the workers have gone on strike how do you reward the workers and bring them up to motivation or bring their motivation up you don't need any part of e1 p1 and f1 simply put yourself in that situation and come up with an answer similarly a tabular analysis can be given you know they can create a table and tell you that if we go for x project these are the benefits y project these are the benefits and the drawbacks you need to simply analyze aspects from both the projects and then suggest what way we should go forward for this you need no knowledge of e1 p1 and f1 
So what I'm trying to tell you is from the business oriented side or the business perspective, there can be questions that come up that are from the syllabus, but others which are absolutely nothing to do with the syllabus, but your simple business acumen is required to answer the same. So for business oriented questions, may there be anything, you must know the pre-scene excellently well. And to do that, we have a full three hour pre-scene analysis for our students. And that tells you every part of the company in detail. So if anything related to the business is asked, you'll be able to relate. Ethics and corporate governance, part of your F1 syllabus, internal auditors need and what do they do? Again, part of your E1 syllabus, the cost transformation model, part of your P1 syllabus. Throughout this entire video, what we've tried to do is sum up important areas which we feel are you know, key issues which come up in the exam and key issues which students must know before they enter the exam because topics and questions in the exam do revolve around the same. I hope you found this video helpful. If you have any other questions, please do reach us. Thank you for your time and thank you for being here.